So Game Freak have canonically stated that a Pokemon's base stats are reflective of their design. If there were ever a Pokemon to make you question that notion, it's Onyx. When we all saw this giant hulking rock snake in the anime, I'm sure we all imagined its awesome power would be matched in the games. But... Uh? Is this some kind of twisted joke? No, Onyx, it isn't. I'm gonna say up front that I think Onyx is the worst Pokemon we've covered so far. We're dealing with a base stat total of 380, which is on par with Delcaddy in early gens, but even Delcaddy got a buff to 400 later on. Onyx is an absolutely abysmal Pokemon, despite being somewhat popular among the fanbase. In the anime, Brock's Onyx was gifted to him by his dad for his 10th birthday. And I gotta say, I really respect the older anime for not being afraid to tackle dark topics like child abuse. Poor Brock knows better than anybody that Onyx's laughable lack in strength has become something of a meme in recent years. It's a Pokemon that's so weak that its lack in power has even ruined friendships. It's time for <laughs> oh yeah, that's why I was gonna say give the Quick Claw to Mewtwo is because uh, if you could proc Quick Claw and then have the Flint. What did I say, Brayden? What did I say? What, the fuck? what did I say? I thought I was sturdy. Jesus Christ! I'm never listening to you ever. <sighs> and I thought Pokemon was supposed to bring people together. People love to point out how this mountain of a Pokemon has less attack than many first form weaklings like Pidgey, Oddish, and Slowpoke. Our stat distribution is definitely interesting. Say what you will, but these stats are by definition min-maxed, which on paper is what we want, but our resources are spent in all the wrong places. A colossal defense stat of 160 is undeniably great. But when it comes at the cost of an HP stat of 35 and our special defense stat of 45, our dreams of being any kind of tank are pretty much out the window, outside of maybe the early game when all we tend to face are normal types. What is slightly interesting about Onyx's stats is its barely passable speed stat of 70, which sets it apart from 90% of the other rock types out there. The only real use we see out of this is actual use of the 30% flinch chance from Rock Slide. So yeah, we can get some pathetic chip damage off before getting one shot by a bubble. But to become viable, we're gonna need a lot more help than that. Onyx is also a Rock Ground type Pokemon, which is a pretty abysmal type combo with no defensive synergy, which doesn't bode well for a defensive Pokemon like Onyx. This dual typing infamously gives us two quad weaknesses to water and grass, which are extremely commonplace no matter what game we're playing. Literally the first lesson the games teach us in Gen 1 is that water and grass beat the crap out of Onyx specifically. On top of that, we're also weak to ice, fighting, ground, and steel. So six weaknesses total. Now this may be kicking Onyx while he's down, but I would go as far as to say that we're also weak to pretty much any special attack due to our stat distribution. You would not get very far bringing Onyx into, say, a Psychic Gym. Now Rock Ground is actually pretty solid offensively, but again, with our almost non-existent attack stat, super effective damage alone is not enough to get the one-shot most of the time. It is, however, worth noting that we do resist some very common types like Normal, Flying, and Poison. Onyx and the rock type in general tend to thrive in the early game where these types are commonplace and opposing Pokemon only know moves like Tackle. But once the mechanics start to get a little more complex and new types are introduced, Onyx gets left in the dust. So yeah, our typing is definitely not doing us any favors. But unfortunately, I can't bring myself to change our typing. I get that on paper, the rock ground type is beaten to death and at this point, it seems like a pretty brain-dead choice for a typing, since rocks and the ground are so similar. But for Onyx in particular, it actually makes sense. We're a snake, made entirely of rocks, who digs at high speeds through the ground. That's about it. We would be so much better defensively if we were just rock or just ground. But I can't bring myself to do it. It just makes too much sense to keep it as it is. 
I feel like at this point, I should mention that Rock is my least favorite type. So it's taking a lot of willpower for me to keep our typing as is. I won't go too in depth here as I might make a video on this in the future, but I feel like 90% of Rock types have the exact same archetype of a slow tank with physical bulk and not much else. And many types like Steel or Ground do that so much better. On top of that, there aren't many Rock moves that allow us to create interesting strategies. Most of them are just regular attacks with a secondary effect if we're lucky. But my god, these moves are terrible overall. What is it going to take to get some Rock type moves that actually have good accuracy? I don't get why they do this. Sure, there's Ancient Power and Power Gem, but how many Rock types are special attackers? The Rock type is lucky it gets looped in with ground so often, so that all the Rock types can use actually good moves like Earthquake. Say what you will about bad types like Ice, but even though you may not want an Ice type Pokemon, you definitely want an ice type move for all the dragon types you will inevitably face in the game's climactic fights. And I think that's worth a lot. In game, I personally don't think ice is the worst type like most people think it is. You will almost always want at least an ice type move for major fights. I get that ice is the worst in competitive and maybe a Nuzlocke too, but in a regular in game playthrough, rock types are definitely one of the worst types out there. Okay, my little rant is over. Due to my beef with our typing, I initially struggled to think of how I could possibly salvage this Pokemon, more so than I ever have before. Especially since I haven't even addressed the elephant in the room, which is the fact that Onyx has already been fixed in the form of Steelix, an evolution I received in Generation 2, with a much better typing, swapping Rock out for Steel, which actually allows it to tank, on top of actually acceptable stats. Despite this, Onyx specifically has been one of my most highly requested Pokemon. But why would anyone in their right mind choose Onyx over Steelix, aside from not having any friends to trade with to evolve it? That's what I'm going to try to answer today. I guess the ideal model to base this video off of is the Scyther line. Caesar is the better option in most cases, but there's still reason to use Scyther even if you can't trade. He's a different typing, learns different moves like Technician Boosted Wing Attack, which only Scyther would get stabbed from. These two Pokemon even have the exact same base stat total. Now, Onyx and Steelix don't have the same base stat total, and I'm not going to change that. Steel Ground will almost always be the better type, and Steelix as a whole will always be the better option, but I'm going to try to create some reason to leave us as an Onyx. But that is a seriously tall order. So how are we going to do it? Well, I could take Onyx through Kanto, a gen where Steelix is unavailable, and that would make sense. It's also Onyx's debut generation. But I honestly don't think it's possible to make Onyx good in these games without some seriously drastic changes. The main reason is a lack of physical special split. No matter how strong we become, without changing stats, we'd still get washed by any water or grass type move which our rival and Pokemon League champion Blue will always have two of. If you want any evidence of this, I would direct you to Madrybred's video where he tried to beat Fire Red with only an Onyx. In it, he had to level up Onyx to level 100 and still lost to Lorelei who could still easily one-shot him with a water move. So yeah, we're gonna need some mechanics of later gens to actually make Onyx useful. I could take us through Johto where Rock types actually do really well, at least in the early game, resisting all of the first three gyms. And we also get an Onyx before the first gym in an in-game trade in Violet City. But after that, I would say Onyx still loses to every gym leader after Whitney since they all either counter Rock or are special attackers. Plus, Steelix is still available in these games, and you can actually get a Metal Coat before beating the Elite Four. I still think we need to go a little further for Onyx to shine. So I think the best fit for Onyx is actually Gen 5's Black and White 2. And let me explain why. Not only has Gen 5 introduced some new moves, mechanics, and abilities which we'll get into later, but they've also introduced a new item, the Eviolite, an item that raises the defense and special defense of the holder, but only if they can still evolve. In other words, Onyx can make use of this item, but Steelix cannot, 
so it might patch up our piddling special defense stat and allow us to do some actual tanking in the late game. The only asterisk with Gen 5 is that Onyx isn't available until Relic Passage, when the player has two badges. Now this availability isn't bad at all, it's actually pretty solid. But when Rock Ground is such a great answer to both of the gems before Onyx is obtainable, it would be a crime to not include him in the adventure a little bit earlier. So for the first time in this series, I'm going to be tweaking a Pokemon's availability. But, there aren't any routes early on that make sense for Onyx to show up in. So what are we going to do? Well, remember that NPC from Johto who trades you an Onyx in Violet City for a Bellsprout? Well, let's say that this same guy has moved to Flockacy Town in the Unova region, and he still gets off on manipulating young children into trading for the terrible Rock Snake Pokemon. But this time, we'll show him just how strong Onyx can be. Hypothetically, I would say that he'd ask for a Sunkern in exchange, which is available in the adjacent Route 20. He asked for a Bellsprout in the Johto games, so maybe he's a little bit nostalgic for a Grass-type Pokemon, this time from his home region. Now I will say that I'm not smart enough to actually program this NPC or an in-game trade into the game, so I'm just going to be giving myself an Onyx once I reach that point. This means that I'll still be able to nickname him, and I won't get the 50% experience boost from traded Pokemon. I'll say that this change in availability isn't really necessary, and we may be overpowered in the early game, but it's mainly for the purposes of a YouTube video. To go about a quarter of the game without our Project Pokemon is too long in my opinion. I'm curious what your thoughts are about how I'm implementing this and if I should change anything for Pokemon with late availability going forward, so let me know in the comments. With all of that out of the way, since we're not changing our typing, I want to first take a look at our abilities. First up is Sturdy. Now that we're in Gen 5, this ability is actually useful. Another reason why we've set our sights on the Unova games. Basically, we can't be taken out in a single hit, which will come in handy if we're ever facing a water or grass type, which, inevitably, we will be. Other than that, we have Rockhead, which in earlier gens was probably the better choice since Sturdy had little to no use, because it used to only apply to one-hit KO moves like Sheer Cold, which are extremely rare. This ability prevents recoil damage, which, for Onyx in particular, is next to useless. We only learn one recoil move at level 49 in Double Edge, but I'll remind you that our attack stat is only 45. Making good use out of Rockhead would imply that we're actually doing real damage in the first place. When we do like 3 damage to the opponent with Double Edge, we're only preventing 1 HP of recoil in return, which obviously is not worth a lot. Both of these abilities make sense for our character, but we'll need to go a bit farther to make Onyx viable and I think Rockhead is the one I want to get rid of. An ability that plays off of our offense will not be of any use to us. Luckily, there are a lot of decent Rock-type abilities that make sense for pretty much any Rock-type. Take Solid Rock, for example, which reduces super effective moves by 25%. Basically, it can turn any 4 times weakness into only 3 times. All Pokémon who have this ability have a quad weakness, and so does Onyx, so Solid Rock is a pretty good option. Shell Armor, or Battle Armor, is another good one that's used by many defensive Pokémon. This one prevents all critical hits, which is very useful in a Nuzlocke when trying to set up or just get a reliable switch in. But for a Pokémon as feeble as Onix, we're going to need to bring out the big guns. There is one ability that I feel can salvage any rock or ground type. Sandstream. This ability triggers a Sandstorm as soon as the Pokémon switches in. Sandstorm does chip damage of 1 16th HP of all Pokemon on the field unless they are Rock, Ground, or Steel types. So it's a nice little boost in our damage output, but Sandstorm also increases the special defense of all Rock types like Onix as long as it is active. This means that Onix will now have the ability to tank not just physical, but special attacks as well, which was previously one of our biggest weaknesses. Coupled with the fact that weather effects are permanent in Gen 5, and I feel like we've got a really good starting point here. Weather-inducing abilities are pretty overpowered, hence why they were nerfed to only lasting 5 turns in later gens. But if any Pokémon needed this level of help, it's Onix. I don't think Sand will be as overpowered as its counterparts Drought and Drizzle are for their respective weather conditions, since it doesn't actually power up Rock-type moves. 
and giving these overpowered abilities to weak Pokemon isn't unheard of, so why not Onix? I also think Sandstream fits with our character. Take a look at the other Pokemon who get it. Hippowdon, Tyranitar, and Gigalith. The through line here is that all these Pokemon are pretty gargantuan in size. And size is actually one of the only things Onix has going for it. I feel like this colossal monster emerging from the ground would cause an explosion of sand everywhere. So I think I've convinced myself that this ability, despite being pretty broken, makes sense. Because this ability alone still isn't going to be enough to get Onyx out of the hole that Game Freak has dug for him. Let's take a look at our moveset. And I gotta say, this is actually pretty good. We get almost everything a rock type would ever want and learn a new move about every three levels. This must have been Game Freak's attempt to patch up how dirty they did Onyx when they created it. It didn't work. For a Pokemon with as many weaknesses as Onyx, this still isn't enough and there's a lot of overlap with moves like Rock Throw, Rock Tomb, and Smackdown, for example, which are all 50 base power rock type moves. It's a big moveset, so I'm only going to highlight moves I'm changing, and I'll brush over the ones that I don't. I think it's more interesting if these moves are exclusive to Onyx, because it offers the player the choice on when to evolve. Most moves make sense on Steelix as well, and many are by TM too, but again, let's try to give us some reason to stay as an Onyx. We learn 4 moves off the get-go in Mudsport, Tackle, Harden, and Bind. The only move I have a problem with here is Tackle. I think I want to pull Rage down from level 10 to learn here. It's not specified in the Pokedex anywhere, but our moveset kind of implies that Onyx has a bit of a temper and might go on some temper tantrums. We've definitely got the bulk this early on to take the hits required to build up this move's power, so it should be pretty good. I'm just trying to create a little bit more space down the line. I think the Anger aesthetic is what they were going for when they added Curse at level 4. This move allows Onyx to say words like heck and damn, and I'm just quoting what he says by the way. This is an insanely good move to get this early on, and despite it probably being our best move, I'm going to get rid of it in place of another move that we're going to add later. More specifically, I'll let Steelix have it as a level 1 move since I feel it's more fitted for a Pokemon that doesn't care about sacrificing speed. This is what I mean about these two Pokemon being two completely different experiences. Onyx cares about the drop in speed, but Steelix doesn't because he's slow as hell anyway, and it powers up his stab Gyro Ball. Again, we'll come back to this decision in a little bit, I swear I'll make up for it. To fill the slot at level 10 originally filled by Rage, I'm gonna pull down Sand Tomb all the way from level 37, which is way too late for such a trash move. I thought this was a special attack for some reason, but it's apparently physical, which is a good thing, so I guess I'll keep it. Sandtomb gives us the opportunity to get some decent chip damage on the opponent since we definitely aren't one-shotting them. Next, I'm gonna get rid of Rock Tomb entirely at level 13. Like I said, we have so many Rock types already that do pretty much the same thing. This one does drop the opponent's speed, but it's also available via TM anyway, so it's a bit of wasted space. I'm gonna fill it with Rollout, which gives us a chance at doing some actual damage. We're bulky enough to stay alive for 5 turns for sure, at least in the early game, and on turn 5, this move has a base power of a whopping 480, which is insane. Now some of you might ask the question, can Onyx roll? And to you I say, just roll with it. He could probably lie down and roll sideways. See, we can already learn it by breeding. The next change will come at level 22, where I'm going to be swapping out another 50 base power rock move in Smackdown for Bulldoze. We'll get this via TM later anyway too, but it is useful to have a decent ground move for the Electric Gym, and we haven't learned too many ground moves thus far. After that, we usually learn Dragon Breath at level 25. Now Onyx has always had some sort of homage to Dragon types, but choosing this one out of all of them is a missed opportunity, at least in Gen 5. I think that Dragon Tail is more appropriate and could combine well with Stealth Rock which we also learned at level 16 since the AI never switches on its own. Not only is it physical, this Pokemon is definitely more known for its tail than its breath, learning moves like Iron Tail later on. The next change feels a little bit weird to say out loud, but I'm going to be swapping out Slam for Body Slam, which is objectively better at level 28. We could use some moves that are 100% accurate and this is also a stronger option with a 30% chance to paralyze. But our next change is at level 31, and it's the one I'm most excited about. 
we're going to be swapping out Screech for a much better option. Out of all the heinous crimes ever committed against Onyx, it is an absolute Greek tragedy that they did not give the Rock Snake Pokemon the move Coil, an insanely good move learned by most Snake Pokemon that boosts our attack, defense, and accuracy. Now I don't feel I need to explain why boosting attack and defense in a single turn is really good, and Curse already did that, but I'm super excited to see how the accuracy boost from Coil synergizes with all the stupidly inaccurate rock moves we learn. I think that Onyx has the potential to be the best Coil user out there, or at least the most beneficial. Arbok is also saved by this move in later gens and uses it to patch up the low accuracy gunk shot, so I'm hoping that we can do the same with moves like Rock Slide and the infamously 80% accurate Stone Edge. Curse is Steelix move, but I think Coil is a really good move for Onyx. After that, we've got a hole at level 37, originally filled by Sand Tomb, hilariously. So I'm going to pull down Dig to this slot from level 43. This is also a learnable TM, but makes sense for our character and is still one of the best attacks we're going to have up to this point. And then at level 43, we can fill that empty slot from Dig with the ultimate ground type move, Earthquake. Any ground type worth his salt learns this naturally, and we don't get the TM for this before the Elite Four in Black and White 2, so this is much needed. I was shocked to learn that we don't get this already. And finally, our last change is going to be to our ultimate move at level 52, where we usually learn Sandstorm. It's an odd placement for our ultimate move, and our new ability basically makes this useless. Plus, if your Onyx still has Sturdy and you still want this, you can pick it up via TM already at the Mistralton City Pokemon Center, so I'm gonna fill it with another Dragon-type move. Given our character as a rampaging giant, you might expect me to give us Outrage here. And while that could also work, I actually want to give us Dragon Rush, a strong dragon move that could use a little more accuracy and should synergize well with Coil. I think it fits here because Dragon Rush actually has a secondary effect. I feel like it's supposed to reflect the difference in size between a massive dragon and the presumably much smaller opponent. I think this is why it does double damage and cannot miss versus opponents who have used the move Minimize in later gens. We won't get any use of this mechanically since this secondary effect wasn't introduced yet in Gen 5, but I just want to use it to justify it for our character since we are such a giant Pokemon. Ultimate moves are usually next to useless since they're after the Elite Four level cap, but this is not the case here as we will have this when we challenge the League and it will probably come in very handy against Iris and her Dragon types. Okay, that was a lot of changes, but poor Onyx needed a lot of help to become viable. It's a rocky road ahead. Does Onyx have what it takes? It's time to find out. As usual, I'm going to be building a full team to complement Onyx and the changes we've made to it. I'll be playing with level caps that are based around each gym leader and elite four members ace. I will only be using held items in battle, no items from the bag, and I will be playing on set mode. Onyx, it's time to prove to the world that we're not some kind of twisted joke. Let's rock and roll. So to start off, I choose Tepic as our starter, but I'm not actually going to be using it in the run. I've got a whole team in mind that Tepic sadly won't be a part of. Sorry buddy, next time. I mostly just want Hugh to pick Oshawott to give us more of a challenge since we're quad weak to water. I could let him pick Snivy as well, but Oshawott is a special attacker and I want to see if we can actually tank the special attacks. Plus, this way, Q will also have the Grass-type Simisage on his team, so this is definitely the hardest option. I'll note that I won't always pick the hardest option for our runs, only when I feel like it's most interesting. In this case, we buffed our special defense with Sandstream, and I just want to see if it'll actually come in handy. Once we reach Flockacy Town and Route 20, I can add Onyx to our team. Again, I can't program an actual in-game trade, I'm just giving myself an Onyx once we reach this point. Even though it's a female Onyx, I name her Brayden, after a man who will be proven right today. Now because this is a Pokemon I generated myself, I'll note that I just randomized our nature and IVs. We have a gentle nature which is pretty interesting. It's a net negative for sure, as we're losing 10% of our colossal defense, but we still do have defense to spare, and we could use some more special defense. Our ability is Sandstream. I didn't randomize that, as I always tend to go with the new ability I've added. 
I'm hoping that this is going to be our saving grace for pretty much the whole run, and it'll be some nice chip damage in the early game too. Our moves at level 5 are Mud Sport, Rage, Harden, and Bind. Mostly the same as usual except for Rage. It doesn't really matter what our moves are at this point, as I think we're going to destroy the first two gyms since we resist them super hard. Next up is Flockacy Ranch where I catch two new Pokemon to add to our team. The first is Lillipup, but unlike most Lillipup users, I make sure to catch one with the pickup ability, the one that notoriously does not become Intimidate. Instead, we'll get Sand Rush, which will give it some fun synergy with Onyx's Sand Stream. A fun use for Stoutland that probably doesn't get seen very often. And the other team member is a familiar face, Psyduck. Now to be clear, this is not the Psyduck I used in my previous video. It's just a plain old Psyduck. It won't have any new moves or the psychic typing. But in this case, I actually want a plain old Psyduck with the Cloud 9 ability, which negates weather effects so long as this Pokemon is on the field. Basically, it's a water type that won't get buffeted by our own Sandstorm, and that sounds like synergy to me. If you can't already tell, we're building a sand team for this run, which I think will be really fun. The concept of building a team around a certain Pokemon is pretty unexplored for in-game playthroughs, and I like when I come across the opportunity to do so. It won't always happen, and I'm not going to force it. Sometimes I'm just going to be using a bunch of randos, but it is more fun when I have something to build around. After that, we've got our second rival fight, which gives us a good look at how Onyx fares in the early game. Oshawott doesn't know Water Gun yet, so it can only tackle us. Our main strat right now is to get off an early bind, which stacks with our Sandstorm for some decent chip each turn. And we need that because our attacks with Rage are abysmal. Like, worse than I thought. Although getting hit with Tackle does boost its power each time it hits, and we can take a lot of them. Again, it's going to be a lot of long fights where Onyx will simply have to outlast the opponent. I guess that's what I'd want a Rock-type Pokemon to do. Nevertheless, the level 8 Oshawott goes down, getting us the win. Time for Charon, who I'm not expecting to be very hard. We've got a couple new moves in Sand Tomb and Rollout now, both moves that lean into our ability to play the long game. I start off with a Sand Tomb or some chip on Patrat before starting up a Rollout. We knock him into healing range, but we don't really care. It's just more turns for Rollout to increase in power. He gets some chip on us with Bite, which is neutral on us, but two more Rollouts take him down, sending in Lillipup. Unfortunately, our Rollout misses, breaking our chain. This is what I mean about inaccurate rock moves. Instead, I go for the inaccurate ground move and get some chip with Sand Tomb. Lillipup is actually getting some decent damage on us with Bite, but moments like this are why I really value Onyx's speed, because flinching isn't a danger here, which is actually really nice. Eventually, I take it down with a couple more attacks. That was pretty free, as I expected, but not game-breaking, because Charon's team at least has Dark-type moves that can do some damage to us. I'm not awarding too many points for this win, as again, I'm only giving us Onyx this early for the purposes of this video. We already know rock types are good early on, so we'll see if this holds up. Once we reach Burbank Complex, I catch another team member, Magnemite. Not a ton to say here really, it's a steel type so it won't take damage from Sandstorm, and it can counter both our quad weaknesses in grass and water. Just a solid addition all around. Time to face Roxy and her poison types, who we also resist. But, if we can't take her out fast enough, we can still go down to Poison. She leads with Coughing, and I decide to go for Stealth Rock for damage on her Ace Whirlipede upon switching. This move is almost never useful in-game, but might come in handy here and against the next two gyms. But really, Rollout is all we need here. Since we resist Poison, the AI Coughing decides to only go for Assurance, which we easily tank, and can get our Rollout Chain going, which takes out the entire rest of her team. Rollout might seem pretty busted this early, but that's because Onyx is actually a good user of it, since she can actually survive 5 turns needed to max it out. Plus, we easily could have won these first two gym fights without it. Oh thank you for wasting my Pecha Berry by the way, Whirlipede. Now we're done with the early game, and now, I expect the difficulty to ramp up for us. Berg and his bugs might seem easy on paper, but he's got grass types too, which are really gonna hurt us. Once we reach Castelia City, we can grab the Eviolite from this scientist. I'm hoping this will be our bread and butter item for most of the run, and one of the main reasons we chose Gen 5 in the first place. Hopefully, it'll give us a fighting chance against Berg. Unfortunately, this just isn't Onyx's fight. Berg leads with this Swadloon, who's part grass and knows Razor Leaf, which immediately takes out half of our health, even with the Eviolite. 
I get us some stealth rocks and then a rock throw since I don't want to lock myself into rollout. Instead, why don't we see how the rest of our team synergizes with sand? I bring in sand rush herdier first. I didn't teach this thing return and tackle doesn't take him out so Berg uses a hyper potion. Our takedowns do surprisingly little damage but Sandstorm is doing some nice chip and we don't get buffeted because of our ability. Eventually, we win the War of Attrition and take it out, bringing in Dwebble who's part rock type and therefore won't get buffeted by the Sandstorm but instead gets a plus one special defense boost just like Onyx does. That is, until we bring in Cloud9 Psyduck who clears all weather effects so long as he's on the field meaning our Water Pulse is easily enough to take it out with some Stealth Rock Chip to break Sturdy. And in comes his Ace, Lee Vanny, and I switch into Magnemite. Once Psyduck is off the field, Sandstorm effects are back in play. But since we're part Steel, we don't get buffeted, but Lee Vanny does. I decide to paralyze it first with Thunder Wave and start chipping away with Sonic Boom, and eventually we take this thing down. That was a really fun fight. I don't think I want Onix, or any Pokemon really, to solo every single fight in the game. Sandstorm alone was extremely useful and created some fun strategies that our whole team was able to use effectively. I really like that when Onyx can't handle a situation, the rest of our team has our back. Good work team. On my way to Nimbasa City, I catch another team member in Trap Inch. I know we already have a ground type in Onyx, but I needed something that could learn Fly and didn't get buffeted by Sand, and Flygon is really cool. And next is Elisa, the electric type gym leader and Yep, we win pretty easily. But it is nicer now that we have Bulldoze. Finally, a stab move that's 100% accurate. I will say that Onyx is probably the best Pokemon available for this gym. There are a lot of ground types available like Drillbur and Sandial, but they don't resist Elisa's normal attacks. There are also Rock types available like Roggenrola and Dwebble, but they don't resist Electric and can get paralyzed. Onyx being the only rock ground type available by this point is one of the few times I would rather be a rock and a ground type. Just figured I'd point it out since it is a nice little win. Alright, we've done pretty well so far, but the early game is definitely over and Clay is going to be pretty tough coming up. But before that, on my way to Driftvale City, I catch my final team member, Solosis. His overcoat ability also prevents damage from Sandstorm, so now we've got a pretty diverse team of Pokemon that thrive in the sand that Onyx sets up. Sand overall is a pretty diverse weather condition compared to the others with three types that are automatically immune as opposed to say, Hail which only really synergizes with Ice. Sand is one of the more fun teams to build around in my opinion for this reason. After that, we've got this fight against former team Plasma Sage, Rude. I'm only really showing this to say that we've learned Coil now which I'm hoping is going to be a real turning point for us. This move can boost our defense to astronomical levels even at only plus one. I'm a little disappointed at how little a boosted bulldoze does to this hurrier, but we've definitely got the physical bulk we need. And what I really appreciate is the accuracy boost which we can use to land a reliable rock throw to one shot his swoobat. It hasn't come up much in major fights, but the inaccurate rock moves are really annoying and with coil, those days are hopefully behind us. Time for clay and I was expecting this one to be tough. He leads with Krokorok who drops our attack with intimidate and has a super effective bulldoze which drops our speed. But I set up a coil to reduce its damage. We're actually holding the leftovers in this fight instead of the Eviolite because I've been finding that I appreciate the HP recovery a little bit more. Krokorok hits us with a torment so we can't use the same move twice in a row. But once our speed is dropped to a point where Krokorok outspeeds us, he won't go for bulldoze anymore. So I actually don't want to hit him back with our strongest attack, a bulldoze of our own because then his speed will drop and he'll bulldoze us right back. So instead, I Dragon Tail, which brings in Sand Slash. Since we're still slower, he also doesn't want to bulldoze, and instead goes for Crush Claw and then locks himself into Rollout, which we quad resist. Basically, he just gave us like 5 free turns to set up as much as we can while we only take about 2 damage in the process. Our physical bulk even without the Eviolite, and even with a bad nature, is still ridiculous. Eventually we get up to plus 2 attack and plus 3 defense and accuracy, and I decide to Dragon Tail him out. Dragon Tail is also 90% accurate by the way, so Coil helps patch that up too. But it brings Krokorok back out, who drops her attack again with Intimidate. I don't want to kill anything with Bulldoze because I can't use it twice in a row due to Torment, and I want to be able to Bulldoze his Ace Excadrill as soon as it comes in. So I get off another Coil before taking Krokorok out with a crit Dragon Tail. 
He sends Sand Slash back out, but I can't Bulldoze or Dragon Tail this turn, so I coil once more before forcing him to switch out into my main target, Excadrill. Fishing for the crit, he goes for Slash, but our defense is sky high so we tank it and finally take him out with a single Bulldoze before we can eventually take out his remaining Sand Slash too. That was actually really impressive Onyx. On paper, that was a really tough fight for us, and I was not expecting to solo even with Coil. Torment screwed with us, but it really only delayed the inevitable. I feel like we can wall anything physical even if it's super effective against us, and that's a really scary thing. Watch out Unova. On my way through Chargestone Cave, I pick up the Metal Coat, which is the item that can allow us to evolve into Steelix. And sell it, because we don't need Steelix or any friends to trade with. Onyx all the way, baby. Time for Skyla, and this fight isn't as easy as it might seem on paper. She leaves with Swoobat who outspeeds us and can flinch us with Heart Stamp. But we do dodge a flinch and get off a Rock Tomb, which I swapped out via TM with Bulldoze. We really don't miss Rock Tomb from our level up moveset since it's an infinite TM that can be swapped out for whatever I happen to need at the time. Also Rock Tomb is only 80% accurate in this gen, so accuracy from Coil really helps. Now that we don't need to worry about flinch, I get off a coil and take it out with our new attack, Rock Slide. In comes her ace though, Swana, who also outspeeds. It goes for the quad effective special based bubble beam and... Yeah, I was really hoping we'd live there. I guess Onyx will always have his weaknesses. That was with the Eviolite and the Sandstorm up, so our special defense was at plus two. Oh well, at least Aldridon can finish the fight. It's weird to me that the gym fights you'd expect to be the easiest for us have ended up giving us the most trouble. Like Onyx lost to the bug and flying gyms, but also beat the ground gym. This has been a wild ride, and I honestly have no idea what to expect. Once we reach Undela Town, we've got a fight with Hugh. He leads with Unpheasant, who you'd think would be good setup fodder, but he outspeeds us, and when a Pokemon outspeeds us, they tend to poke holes in our strategy. I go for Rock Tomb, but Unpheasant gets off a taunt so we can't set up Coil. I don't really have a choice other than to take it out with a Rock Slide. This brings in Simisage who resists all of our moves. I decide just to switch out into Stoutland who can tank the Seed Bomb. With Stoutland's Sand Rush, we can outspeed it and take it out with a couple returns. Last is Samurott and I get off some Chip with Return and then Crunch but he takes us out with a super effective Revenge. I decide to let Onyx finish the fight forgetting that Samurott has Aqua Jet here, but we do survive and then take it out with an Earthquake, which we've now learned by level up. That might have seemed like a lot of damage on us, but he was in Torrent range. Sloppy fight, but a win's a win. Time for Drayden, and this is a pretty messy fight too. He leads with Drudagon, and I figure we're just gonna get Dragon Tailed once we try to set up, but we do get up to plus two before hitting him into healing range with a Stone Edge that we just learned. He heals, but a couple Earthquakes finish him off. But this brings in Flygon, another special attacker with a super effective move against us. He goes for Earth Power which does a lot but we do survive and get some chip with Stone Edge. But I gotta switch into our own Flygon for the mirror match, reading the Earth Power which we avoid because of Levitate. We can then get off a Dragon Tail to swap in his ace, Haxorus. I go for Bulldoze to slow him down, but then he takes us out with a Dragon Tail, so I send out Reuniclus. Haxorus has taken some chip damage from the Sandstorm too, so one Psychic can finish it off. Last is the weakened Flygon, who does take us out with a critical hit crunch, but I send in Stoutland to finish the fight. I hope you're seeing how much rock types can really fall off in the late game. Anything with a special attack is a serious threat. Onyx carried hard in the early to mid game, but this is a few disappointing fights in a row. I'm not too upset though, as I do like seeing the Sandstorm synergy from the rest of our team. That is still all thanks to Onyx. And guess what? Right after that, we have to fight Zinzolin, who has a bunch of special attacking ice types. We can live one ice beam from Cryogonal, but it elects to go for Confuse Ray. But we break through and land the Stone Edge, and it's frail enough that we can take it out without setup. The next Cryogonal comes in, but this one just goes for Light Screen for some reason, and we break through again and take it out with another Stone Edge. Last is Weavile, who is a little bit less scary since it's a physical attacker. It gets some chip with Ice Shard, but we live again and clap back with one more Stone Edge. I just want to congratulate myself for being the only gamer alive to ever land three Stone Edges in a row. We got really lucky there. I think it's safe to say that the late game is a real challenge, especially with Marlin and his water types on the horizon. Speaking of, 
time to face the final gym leader. And, yeah. This is one we're gonna need some help with. He leads Karakosa, and I go for Earthquake while he goes for Shell Smash. But, we do still outspeed even when Karakosa's speed is doubled, and the defense drop allows us to take him out with another Earthquake. In comes Waylord though, and I set up a coil while he goes for Scald. Hey, we lived! That's progress, right? But he does get the burn, so Onyx's time in this fight is over. I swap into Reuniclus and start slapping it with energy balls. It takes a few turns, but eventually it goes down, bringing in his ace, Jellicent. I read the ghost move and bring in Stoutland, who's immune. I get off a crunch, and then he gets the Scald burn on us, meaning our second crunch doesn't kill even after Sandstorm. And it triggers Cursed Body, Disabling Crunch, the only move on Stoutland that affects him, so I have to switch. I then misplay and switch into Golduck, who removes Sandstorm when he takes the field, when all we needed was one turn of chip to finish the fight. Whatever, I use Confusion and finish him off. Jeez, tough luck. I feel like we've really lost our momentum. Deciding we need a shot in the arm, I backtrack to Castelia City and grab the TM for rest. Hopefully the ability to heal will give us some more longevity for these big fights coming up. I also head to Mistralton Cave and grab the TM for Rock Slide. We're about to learn Dragon Rush, and we may want to swap moves around in between fights, and this makes it a little bit easier to do this. We already have Stone Edge, but that TM is not available until the post game, and I don't want to waste my heart scales yet. We've got a double battle with Zinzolin next, and they send out Cryogonal and Lipard. Again, I'm worried about Ice Beam, but it targets Hugh's Samurott instead, allowing us to set up a coil, while Samurott takes out Lipard with an Aqua Tail. But next turn we do get hit with an Ice Beam for about half, and then we can take it out with a Stone Edge and Samurott gets another kill on Watchog. Another Cryogonal comes out, but again it elects to go for Light Screen, so we can take it out with another Stone Edge. But the Solipede does get off a Toxic on us, so we've got to end this fight quick. Samurott lands an Aqua Tail, but it doesn't kill and in comes his ace, Weavile. It goes for Ice Shard, but that's physical, so Onyx hangs on and crushes it with one more Stone Edge as Hugh takes out the weakened Solipede with a Slash. Okay, nice. Back in the wing column. We had just enough to win there. Ice moves are scary, but at least we're not quad weak to them. So you'd think with all his Steel types, this Colrus fight would be pretty easy on paper, but we're actually weak to Steel. And he's got a lot of special attackers like this Magneton, who can actually destroy us with Flash Cannon. Hell, even Flygon can barely live a two-shot. And they have Sturdy, so they will get their licks in on us. So basically, I decide to leave with Flygon and break Sturdy with Dragon Tail, which brings in Matang. I decide that this is something Onyx can wall, so I swap her in as it goes for Agility. So it outspeeds and then uses Meteor Mash, which we are weak to, but it's physical so it only does about a third and so we can set up our coils. I can basically set up as many as we want, since I've taught us rest to heal ourselves when we need to. I did delete Stone Edge as I don't think it's really going to be necessary until the Elite Four, and I can just relearn it by then. Eventually, I get up to plus 5 and Matang runs out of Meteor Mashes, so I put it out of its misery with an Earthquake. He brings in BHM because it has Energy Ball, but Onyx is faster and can get the one-shot. In comes the weakened Magneton, but since Sturdy is broken, it's no threat, and it also gets one shot. But, he's got another one, in Magnezone, who also has Sturdy. I get off an Earthquake, which knocks it to 1 HP, and it hits us with a Flash Cannon. But for once, we've got the special bulk to hang on with 40 HP. Chorus heals, but it's no use since we're faster, so eventually, it falls to another Earthquake. Last is his ace, Kling Klang, who holds an Air Balloon meaning it's immune to Earthquake until we get some chip damage on it. I could play it safe and rest, but I decide to trust Onyx's bulk. But my heart drops when Kling Klang outspeeds us and goes for a super effective gear grind, which knocks us down to just 24 HP, while I go for a Dragon Rush to pop his balloon. Now we can take him out with Earthquake, but we have to dodge two crits. Our girl holds and finishes the fight with one last Earthquake. Sure, we needed a little help from Flygon there, but this is a really well-designed fight that not many Pokemon can solo. I'm happy to see Rest coming into play to give us some longevity. Time to face the big baddie, Getsus. He leads Kofagrigus who loves to spam Toxic Protect, 
but Rest is always a really, really good counter to Getsus, even in black and white one. He loves to waste turns with Protect, which basically just gives us free turns to set up more coils. I'm actually holding the leftovers in this fight, since I don't think we're gonna need to tank that many attacks for that reason, and I'd rather more HP recovery with leftovers. I'm at plus 4 when I have to rest, which cures my poison, and he goes for Protect that turn too. We just need to tank 2 Shadow Balls until we wake up, which don't do a ton. We're only at about half health when we wake up and go for an Earthquake. But it doesn't kill. Yikes. Plus 4 Onyx? Really? We get hit with another Shadow Ball down to about a quarter health. But I know he's gonna heal, so I do go for one more Coil, healing passively with Leftovers in the process. An Earthquake at plus 5 is enough to take it out, but I'm really questioning if we can take out the rest of his team. Seeing the kill with a water move, he sends out the bulky Seismitoad, but we do outspeed and find the damage to take it out with Earthquake. Next is Drapion, who has a super effective Earthquake of his own, but we're set up to high health physically, so we tank it and hit him back with a taste of his own medicine. In comes Toxicroak, who's part fighting. He could go for Brick Break or even the special move Shadow Ball, but instead goes for Sucker Punch, which doesn't do much, and we crush him with another Earthquake. We probably could have lived those other moves, but there's still a lot more fight left. He sends out his ace, the pseudo-legendary Hydreigon, who has a physical move set, so Onyx hangs on from a Dragon Rush, and we can clap back with one of our own. It is extremely satisfying to have a 100% accurate Dragon Rush when combo with Coil, by the way. And last is Electros, who's got a very diverse move pool. He also has Levitate, so Earthquake won't affect it. I have to go for Dragon Rush, which doesn't kill without Stab. He goes for a special move in Flamethrower, but Onyx the Eternal hangs on and finishes the fight with one last Dragon Rush. That was a really good fight. Black and White 2 have so many well put together boss fights with a lot of diverse teams like this one. We've given Onyx the tools she needed to put up a fight and she didn't let us down. It's easy to overlook Onyx's speed as most rock types would have gotten outsped and one shot by Seismitoad at the very beginning. Shout out to getting great use out of Dragon Rush too. Really great work Onyx. At the end of Victory Road, we've got our final rival battle against Hugh. He leaves with Unpheasant, who again might seem like good setup fodder, but he pivots out with U-Turn into Samurott, who can one-shot us with Surf, so I have to switch out into Golduck. But he isn't really a good answer either, as all we can really do is use Confusion, and eventually we get out-muscled and Golduck goes down. I send in Magnezone to take it out with a Bolt Switch and pivot Onyx back in, as he sends out Simisage. When I decided to choose Tepig as my starter, I assumed this thing would have Seed Bomb, which Onyx might have had a chance at surviving. But it actually knows Energy Ball, so we've got to switch out again. I send out Flygon, who can't even take two Energy Balls, and goes down before even getting a shot in. I send out Magnezone, who hangs on from a Brick Break on 1 HP and gets some chip, but after that, he goes down too. I send in Reuniclus to hit a hard Psychic to take it out, but our team members are dropping like flies. We really don't counter Grass or Water types very well at all. In comes Bufalon who knows Earthquake and I have to let Reuniclus go down too. Onyx, we need you to lock it down buddy. We are weak to Earthquake, but we're still bulky enough to get a few coils off before using Rest to get back to full health. Before we wake up, we still need to eat a few Earthquakes that take us down to about half. But we do eventually wake up and take him out with an Earthquake of our own. And last is the Unpheasant. It goes for Swagger, which is kind of scary, but we won't hit ourselves too hard as our base attack is so low and our base defense is so high. But we do break through anyway and land a Dragon Rush, but even at plus 5 attack, it still doesn't kill. That is rough, but we do break through on the very next turn too and land one more to get the win. Onyx definitely pulled her weight there, even though half of Hugh's team could one-shot us. If I could go back, I think I would let Hugh choose Snivy as a good middle ground. Maybe then we'd stand more of a chance in these rival fights. But, Superior would outspeed us, and Leaf Blade is a high crit move, so Onyx still probably wouldn't be a great option. Like I said in the beginning, it's always tough being a rock ground type when your rival will almost always have a water or grass type, and it's too bad we couldn't overcome this issue. Regardless, we've made it to the Pokemon League. We've picked up a little momentum in the very late game, but each one of the Elite Four is insanely threatening to us. 
All of them are going to have super effective moves against us, and I'm not really sure if we can deal with them. Some of them are very strong special attackers as well. These are going to be some of the toughest fights we've faced yet. But I have this Onyx, and she's got something to prove to the world today. I decided that the set I needed to go with is Rest and Coil, which are absolutely necessary for setup and longevity. Earthquake for reliable stab, and Stone Edge from the Move Relearner in place of Dragon Rush. I know we're going to be facing three dragons in the champion fight, but there are some flying types and some bulky Pokemon like Lapras that I really need to hit super effectively. Our stats are okay. Our attack is weak, so we need to get off a lot of coils to do any kind of real damage, but my main concern is our HP, which has been a real hindrance that often prevents us from getting set up. We've maxed out our level cap, and I have a bunch of elixirs. No turning back now, let's rock their world, Onyx. I decide that Grimsley is probably the easiest. We were lucky to pull a female Onyx because his lead Liebherd can't attract us, so it's pretty easy to set up on it with Coil and Rest. Night Slash is a high crit move, but even when it does crit, it's not that scary. We're at plus 4 when we take it out with an Earthquake. But I probably should have set up all the way because in comes Crocodile who packs a stab Earthquake. One poorly timed crit, and we're a goner. Onyx, I need you to hold. I sneak in the last couple coils as Crocodile hits us at low health. But Onyx grinds her teeth and holds on, and we can rest back up to full health. After a couple more earthquakes, we wake up and finally fire off an earthquake of our own, which is enough to take the Crocodile down. But out comes Scrafty, who isn't much better, packing the super effective high jump kick. But we do outspeed it and hit it with an earthquake, but it just barely doesn't kill. However, it only goes for Rock Tomb, which does nothing, and the Sandstorm Chip comes in clutch to finish it off. Last is his Ace Bisharp, who would be scary if it had Iron Head to flinch us, but it only has Metal Claw, which we can tank and finish the battle with one more earthquake. That was the easiest fight, and we still had to work really hard for it. The Pokemon that we're fighting in the late game all trounce us in terms of raw stats, so we need the bulk to set up as much as possible. One down. Next, I take on Caitlyn and her Psychic types. Special attackers are scary, but she leads with this Musharna, who can only attack us with Dream Eater, which only works when we're asleep, and her only way of putting us to sleep is with Yawn, which takes two turns. Basically, this gives us a free turn here and there to get a coil off, but at plus 2, we do fall asleep. It goes for Dream Eater, but with Eevee like plus Sandstorm, we actually take it surprisingly well. We can live 3 of them, but sleep can last up to 5 turns, so we need Onyx to wake up. But I'm gonna need your help viewer to wake up Onyx. Say it with me. Onyx, wake up. Onyx, wake up. You're not saying it with me, guys. Onyx, wake up. Let's go Onyx, making us immune to the Dream Eater that would have killed us and get off a coil. I can even get up another one since Yawn takes two turns, so we're at plus four. Now we rest, which puts us back to sleep, but only for a guaranteed two turns. And the AI isn't smart enough to know that, so it'll still use Dream Eater on turn three. So we get off a fifth coil for good measure before taking it out with a Stone Edge. But we're only going to be at 51 HP for the rest of the fight. In comes Reuniclus, another bulky special attacker, but plus 5 Stone Edge is enough to take it out, and in comes another threat, Sigalith, who packs Ice Beam. But shockingly, Onyx outspeeds it and gets the kill with another Stone Edge. Last is her ace, Gothitelle. I outspeed and go for another Stone Edge, but it does not kill. But it only goes for Calm Mind. I assume because somehow it didn't see the kill with Psychic, so we can finish it off with another Earthquake. Okay, that was really impressive, Onyx. Finally, the special bulk from Eviolite Sandstorm comes in clutch. Sure, it's not enough to survive quad effective water attacks, but there is no way Vanilla Onyx does anything in this fight, or any of these late game fights for that matter. But we're not out of the woods yet. Let's keep it going. Two down. So I was very scared of this Chantal fight. She's got a lot of Pokemon that can hit us super effectively with special attacks. She leads with this Cofagrius, who, according to Bulbapedia, knows Grass Knot, which probably would have one-shot us, 
but for whatever reason, it just doesn't go for it, and chooses Shadow Ball instead, which we can tank reasonably well, allowing us to set up 4 coils before we need to rest. We tank a couple more Shadow Balls while asleep, but he's taking quite a bit of Sandstorm ship, so a plus 4 Earthquake is enough to take it out. In comes Chandelure, who has Energy Ball, but we outspeed and get the one shot with Earthquake. Next is Golurk, who's a physical attacker. I see the opportunity to sneak in one more coil while we eat the Earthquake. Now we have a guaranteed one shot with an Earthquake of our own. And last is Drift Limb. One of the reasons I chose Stone Edge over Dragon Rush, because Dragon Rush makes contact and we would die to Aftermath. But a super effective Stone Edge is easily enough to finish this fight. I'm a little confused by what happened with Akafagrigus there. Maybe the AI can't read our Pokemon's weight so it thought Shadow Ball would do more? Regardless, our speed was absolutely crucial there. Most rock types would get decimated by Energy Ball from Chandelure, but Onyx is just built different. Three down, one Elite Four member left. Can Onyx complete the gauntlet? On to our greatest challenge yet, Marshall, the fighting type master. The only saving grace here is that his whole team is physical. He leads with Throw, who wouldn't be that scary if he wasn't packing Storm Throw, which always crits and crits will bypass the defense buff from Coil and possibly Eviolite, I don't really know. Let me know in the comments. But, the AI likes to win the speed war, so it elects to go for Bulldoze instead, which doesn't do too much, and I set up a Coil. We still outspeed even at minus one, so I get off an Earthquake to bring him down to just above half health after Sandstorm, while he Bulldozes again. But only now that we're slower, he goes for Payback, a move that doubles in power when you move second. No idea why he didn't go for big damage with Storm Throw, but Onyx sees the opening and finds the high roll on Earthquake to the point where Sandstorm can just barely finish him off. Nice. In comes Mianxiao, a serious threat with high jump kick which knocks us into the red. I go for Earthquake, hoping to knock it into healing range, and we do after the Sandstorm chip. As he heals, I say a prayer and go for rest. And my prayers get answered as he decides to go for the two-turn flying-type move, Bounce. Which not only does next to no damage, but also wastes one of the turns we spend sleeping. I have no idea why he did this. After he lands, he goes for a high jump kick which knocks us into about a third, and I get off another coil to get the plus two. I need to go for rest, but Mianxiao goes for Bounce again. What is he doing? I have no idea why the AI went for that. Is it possible he's afraid to take the recoil when missing the high jump kick? I've never seen this before. The headcanon I'm gonna go with is that the AI has no idea how to process me bringing an Onyx into the Elite Four, so it was never programmed to counter it. He just keeps going for bounce, giving Onyx an opportunity to wake up and keep coiling to the point where we can take all of the fighting moves that we need to. And not only that, but then he goes for U-turn, running away in utter fear into his ace, Conkelder. But we're at plus 4 by this point so Hammer Arm doesn't even knock us down to half, and we can take it out with a crit Earthquake. That probably mattered, but we could have finished him off with another one after the speed drop. Regardless, Mianxiao comes back in and now goes for high jump kick, but it's too little too late. We eat it at 49 HP and fire back with an Earthquake and take it down. Last is Sock, who does outspeed us and hits us with a Brick Break. But Onyx hangs on and knocks it into Sturdy, but the Sandstorm tech comes through to finish this fight. What the hell happened there? Was it luck? Was it skill? Was it Onyx's heart and soul? I have no idea. But one thing is certain, we have taken down the entire Elite Four with nothing but an Onyx. That was an absolutely ridiculous series of fights. I love the grit that Onyx has shown when we needed her the most. With one battle left, we follow Onyx to the Promised Land. Well actually, I want to pause for a sec and take a look at this Iris fight. She leads with Hydreigon who outspeeds us and packs the super effective Surf. So right away, soloing with Onyx is out of the question. We'll have to work around it with our whole team. 5 out of 6 Pokemon can hit Onyx super effectively, many of them with special attacks. But I do see room for our speed to come in handy. But overall, it's going to be tough for Onyx to do her thing. But after all that we've been through together, I would never, ever count this Pokemon out. Let's do this. I open the champion fight by sending out Onyx to set up Sand and Bait Surf from the Hydreigon. Then I can pivot into Golduck who resists it. Golduck can take one Dragon Pulse and get off an Ice Beam for about half. 
Expecting the Dragon Pulse again, I swap into Magnezone who resists it, and heals a little bit with leftovers. Once Golduck is off the field, the Sandstorm is back in play for chip damage. Now Hydreigon goes for Flamethrower, but Algernon has just enough to hang on and I go for Thunder Wave to paralyze it. We're basically just stalling for a little bit extra chip, since we outspeed on the next turn because it's paralyzed, and finish him off with a Flash Cannon. We had to take out Hydreigon with Magnezone, because that baits in Aggron who sees the kill with a quad effective Earthquake. But I read that, and Volt Switch into Dapinchi, who is immune with Levitate. Now that we have our target on the field, I can pivot back into Onyx while Aggron uses Autonomize to double his speed. I think now because it's faster, it goes for the flinch with Rock Slide, which it does get a couple times, but the damage is so minimal that it doesn't matter. We don't even need to go for rest, and can just start coiling all the way to plus 5. I have no idea why it doesn't go for Earthquake here, but we would still be bulky enough to survive them. We would just have to mix in a rest every now and then and dodge the crits. Regardless, we are able to set up as much as we need. Time to go, buddy. We take out the Aggron with a quad effective Earthquake. Lapras comes in next who threatens with the quad effective Surf, but this is one water type we can actually counter by outspeeding and taking it out with a super effective Stone Edge. Next is Drudagon, who we also outspeed and can take out with a single Stone Edge. In comes your Ace, the dreaded Focus Sash Haxorus. It's faster and hits an Earthquake, but Onyx tanks it and claps back with an Earthquake of her own, knocking it down into its Focus Sash, but the Sandstorm tech finishes it off. And last is your Archaeops, who goes out with a measly Dragon Claw before getting demolished by one last, fully accurate, super effective, critical hit, Stone Edge. And that is how I would fix Onyx in Pokemon White 2. I have a lot to say about that run. Obviously, we did really well in the early game, as most Rock types do, but there was definitely a drop off toward the mid to late game, but I'm really happy we were able to salvage it at the end. Heading into the run, I thought Onyx would be busted, but I honestly think we gave her the perfect amount of strength. We don't want a Pokemon to solo every single fight in the game. Just because Pokemon like Gyarados and Excadrill exist, doesn't mean they should be our gold standard when considering game balancing. There are some fights that Onyx is meant to handle, and some fights she clearly just isn't. Maybe we could have gotten a little bit more mileage out of her if we let you pick Tepic or something, but I really thought that Sandstorm plus Eviolite would give us the special bulk that we needed, but Onyx isn't a miracle worker, and nor should she be. We're just not meant to counter special attacking water and grass types, and I shouldn't have tried to change that. Onyx has her strengths and weaknesses just like every Pokemon. I think the one thing I could have done to patch that was to make it just rock or just ground, but I stand by my choice to leave Onyx as is. She is a rock type, and she is a ground type. Yeah, Steelix is still better in pretty much every way, but some people can trade for Steelix, and for those people, Onyx is by no means useless anymore. It's easy to forget just how much of a burden vanilla Onyx was. No way would we be able to use her in any fight after Elisa without any of the tools that we gave her and Gen 5 was the perfect place to bring Onyx to her full potential. She needed a lot of help. We needed the Eviolite, we needed Permasand, we needed Coil, we needed Infinite TMs, and we needed the Physical Special Split. I was really happy with how everything came together for us this gen. Coil was the perfect answer to so many of our issues, and helped me actually enjoy using a Rock-type when I don't miss every single attack. Sandstream was vital too. Sure, weather abilities are pretty busted, but if anybody needed this kind of help, it was Onyx. And it allowed for some really fun team building that allowed other Pokemon to thrive around Onyx too. That was really cool. So yeah, we had our ups and downs, but I'm really happy with how this run turned out, because I care. I care about Onyx, and she deserved better. It's a cool Pokemon, and it shouldn't be laughed at. So I hope you enjoyed salvaging this fallen titan with me. It might be a little while until the next video, but next time I want to dig even further with a Pokemon even worse than Onyx. Yup, such a Pokemon exists, I swear. If you think you know who it is, leave a guess down below. If you've got an underappreciated Mon that you want shown some love, let me know in the comments too. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.